You know, I've had the opportunity to travel to a lot of different places, and I've lived in a lot of places, whether that's the metropolitan city or that's a college town. I've lived in both urban and rural areas. And there's always one thing that always seems to follow me wherever I go in any of those places. It's allergies, of all things. And it, no matter what, it's, it's the runny nose, it's the cough, it's the, the itchy eyes. And, and they always go wherever I go. And, and what's crazy is the longer you have them, it somehow turns from allergies just being a little nuisance to suddenly being something really agonizing and painful for some of us. It's interesting, I have a seven-year-old son, and uh, he has his mom's brains and her good looks, but uh, for me, he got allergies, so that's working out great. But when we're talking about something that's agonizing and painful, something that really becomes a burden wherever we go, you know, we very much seek a, a cure, comfort, blessing, something to just take this away from us. It's almost like, oh, if somebody could just make a pill like Claritin, that I could take and just help ease my symptoms uh, just long enough so I can I can see things for, for how they are and I don't have to bother with my nose just for one moment. You know, in the same way, Christ offers a cure for us. You know, we're all broken. We're all in need. And oftentimes we forget the fact that the whole world around us is in a place of brokenness and pain. The poor those in need. You know, and what I want to talk about is Christ's earthly mission. Yes, Christ came to the earth came to the earth and he died for our sins so that we could have eternal life through him. Grace through faith alone. And God also gave him an earthly mission. And I'll explain why he did that in a little bit. But we're going to be reading through Luke 4 14 through 30. And there's three questions that I want you to ask yourself as we go through this text. One is, what was Jesus' mission when he came to earth? What was his mission when he came to earth? Two, why should you care? If God gave Jesus Christ a mission, why should you care what that mission was? And three, what are you going to do about it? Knowing that Christ had a mission on earth and why you should care, where do you go from here? So as we read through this, please remember, this is the word of God. Then Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Holy Spirit, and news about him spread throughout the entire vicinity. He was teaching in their synagogues and being praised by everyone. And then he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as usual, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. A little bit of context going into this. Christ has just returned from the wilderness. While in the wilderness, Satan was trying to tempt Christ to use his deity in a way in which Satan felt like he could manipulate Jesus and therefore claim some type of victory. But Christ did not fail in the least. He offered Satan a miserable defeat using truth and his heavenly father at his side. And as he entered and he began to teach, he became popular. Words about his ability to teach and his wisdom became great throughout the area. So then as he begins to approach his hometown of Nazareth, they know he's coming, and they're anticipating it. And he gets an invite to come and speak in the synagogue. Now, it's important to note, this is a synagogue. This is not a temple. A temple is where sacrifices occur, and many of those traditions you saw take place. A synagogue, if you need a more contemporary kind of uh, look at it, a synagogue is more like what we do in many of our services today, where people would gather worship, they would read from the Torah, and then they would expound upon it. And this is the case for, for Jesus. He is coming here to read the text. Now, before we go into the next portion here, I want to let you know, Jesus is going to choose a very interesting 
text to read from. He's going to read from Isaiah 61. And this particular text is going to make some interesting assertions about who Jesus is saying he is and why he needs to be listened to. So please follow along, and I'll be continuing from verse 17. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, and unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, he has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He then rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. What are some of the assertions that he's just made in this text? First, within verse 18, he says this, The Holy Spirit of the Lord is upon me. It's interesting because here in chapter 4, that happens two other times in addition to this one. In 4.1, he says, Then Jesus left Jordan full of the Holy Spirit and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness. And then in verse 14, Then Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him had spread throughout the entire vicinity. Christ is saying that the Holy Spirit is upon him and is guiding him. And Luke here is saying this is absolutely the truth because we've seen it happen. And he's proclaiming it again here as fulfilled in Isaiah. Now, when you and I look at this text today, we might look at this and say, well, he's talking about being Messiah. He's saying that, you know, I'm the Messiah. I'm about to do all these awesome things. But that's not the case for those in the synagogue at this time. As they're listening to Jesus read from Isaiah 61, what's going to be going through their mind is not anything about the Messiah, but they see this as prophecy, or they're going to see this as a chosen messenger, someone claiming to be the messenger of the Father. And therefore, the words that he's going to say, they need to listen to. So this carries with it weight, and Jesus wanted it to carry weight. And then we want to take time to consider what else he said in this message. Not only did he come as a prophet and as a messenger, but he came with a purpose and a mission. And this is where we're going to get into talking about what is the mission of Jesus Christ? What was that ministry that he came to fulfill? So he said, because the Holy Spirit had anointed me to, he anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim the release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord. The mission of Jesus Christ is to redeem the poor and the broken that listen to him. Again, the mission of Jesus was to redeem the poor and the broken that listen to him. Why? He's God's chosen messenger. You listen to God's chosen messenger. And he sets the example to follow. Who are the poor he's talking about in this text? I would say that when you consider the poor he explains here, well, the poor, the poor of the present are the same as the poor as they were 2,000 years ago. It's one of the few timeless truths. We always say death and taxes. Christ also said you always have the poor. Now, these are individuals that have been abandoned broken and ignored. They're individuals that realize that there's no love in the world for them. And there's an emptiness. There's a need for a deeper comfort than what the world can provide. Let's not forget the poor. Remember that. So the mission of Jesus Christ is to redeem the poor and the broken who listen to him. I'm sure some of you know 
some of those poor and broken individuals. Presently, I live in, in Chicago, and there's not a day in my commute to work where I don't walk by at least six or seven individuals on the side of the road. I've gotten to know a couple of them, know their first names, taking a couple to a meal. But there's so many. And there are times where someone walks by and you, you, you hear the person talk down about the poor. But they have a story and they have a pain. And they need Christ. Let's move on. He then rolled up the scroll. This is Jesus. He rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant. And he sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began saying to them, Today, as you listen, the scripture has been fulfilled. And they were all speaking well of him and were amazed by the gracious words that came from his mouth. Yet they said, Isn't this Joseph's son? Christ proclaimed the truth, and he proclaimed these things to the synagogue. He said, therefore, they are true. He who is anointed in the Holy Spirit, who has proclaimed that these are his ministry, and these are the things that happen, that his mission is to redeem the poor and broken who listen to him. I find it interesting that we need to consider then, what was the response of the synagogue? I think it's interesting. First, they say they speak well of him and were amazed by the gracious words that came from his mouth. Yet, they said, isn't this Joseph's son? It's almost like there was a sense of positive intrigue. Like, oh, yeah, he, he is this great teacher in this area. But he's Joseph's son. He can't be that great, can he? I think this is interesting. This happens right after the wilderness. So first we see this battle between Jesus and Satan, where Satan is trying to use God's deity against Jesus Christ. And here in the synagogue, we see people try to use Christ's humanity against him to bring discredit on him that way. But Christ is consistent in how he handles the situation. So just as he was in the wilderness, what did he do with Satan in the wilderness? He quoted scripture. He quoted truth. And Satan couldn't handle it. And he does the same here. Christ holds nothing back. He stays true to his mission. So this is what he says. Then Jesus said to them, No doubt you will quote this proverb to me. Doctor, heal yourself. What we've heard that took place in Capernaum, do here in your hometown also. This is Jesus Christ talking. This isn't the synagogue saying, do what you did in Capernaum. This is Jesus going back at the synagogue because he can see their distrust. He can see that even though he is a messenger, anointed by the Holy Spirit, that they do not believe him. And so what he is saying here is simply this. Obviously, you don't believe me, and you probably want me to prove it to you, just like I've done everywhere else. You want me to prove it. So, he then continues with his statements. He says, okay, let me make it clear for you this way. Listen carefully. Then Jesus also said, truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. Remember, Christ has just proclaimed that he is a messenger of God. By reading through Isaiah. But I say to you, there were certainly many widows in Israel in Elijah's days. And when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, while a great famine came over all the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them except a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. And in the prophet Elisha's time, there were many in Israel who had leprosy, and yet not one of them was cleansed except Naaman, the Syrian. Christ is rebuking them with truth. And what's interesting here is who is actually being blessed in Jesus' statements? I will tell you this. It's not Israel. It's not Israel. 
Now your temptation is going to be say, oh, it's the Gentiles. Well, that in part is true. Absolutely. When we're talking about Zarephath and Sidon, and we're talking about Naaman and Syrian, they are Gentiles, absolutely, and the blessing goes to them. But the question is, why? Who is it that receives the blessing? With Jesus' mission of redeeming the poor and broken who listen to him, who is it that gets redeemed? Who is it that receives that blessing? It's those who listen. This statement is not about race. It's not that just because these are Gentiles, they will receive the blessing. Or just because you are Israel means you automatically get it. What he is saying is, you Israel have not listened to me. And because you have not listened to me, I will go where I will be listened to. And in this case, that will be the Gentiles. He will redeem the poor and broken who listen to him. So, then we continue. And what we have now is, we see Christ had a teaching. The synagogue had a response of cynicism and unsure and chose not to believe Christ. Christ has now provided his response. And this is how the synagogue in turn reacts. When they heard this, Everyone in the synagogue was enraged. And they got up and drove him out of town and brought him to the edge of the hill that their town was built on, intending to hurl him over the cliff. But he passed right through the cloud, right through the crowd, and went on his way. We're going to be coming up here on the question number two. Why should you care? The only picture I can paint that is somewhat similar to what we're seeing here in the text, and it's appropriate because Thanksgiving was just last week, but it's like the Black Friday sales at the mall or Best Buy or wherever it is you like to go shopping. The crowd gathered in a rioting kind of way. And they came after him. And Christ allowed himself to be pushed towards the edge of a cliff. And this crowd had every intention of killing him. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a foreshadowing of what will happen to Christ at the end of his ministry. He will proclaim the truth. Israel will not listen. His message will be taken to those that will. And then he'll be driven towards death. Except in this case, in this case, Christ chose to not die. In this case, this is where he said, he passed right through the, cloud, the crowd and went on his way. This is, this is significant. He has done exactly what Elijah and Elisha had done in their time as well. When the Israelites would not listen, they went to where they would be listened to. And when the synagogue and the people of his hometown would not listen to him and listen to his message, Christ turned his back and passed through them. Christ's mission of redeeming the poor and broken of those who would listen to him would not be stopped. I think it's important that we stop and reflect on some of what we're seeing here. We live in a culture today that is just raging with, for lack of a better term, political hormones. We live in a culture where if you voted one way or another, before you ever listen to the person, where they are, or even their name for that matter, 
we've already prejudged somebody as worthy of our time, worthy of our mind, or worthy of our effort. The Israelites didn't do anything different in this case. When they heard that Jesus Christ was willing to bless the Gentiles because they were willing to listen, to them it was utter sacrilege. So why do we care? Why do we care that this is God's mission? It's because it was Christ's mission and it was his mission to give to us. All of us are called to serve the poor and the broken. And we are called to listen to the gospel and to share that with the broken. Ultimate hope comes from the gospel of Jesus Christ. His earthly mission was to prepare the church to do what it needed to do, to be his body. And he was showing us the way. He was preaching the kingdom. Don't you remember the Sermon on the Mount? Blessed are the poor. This is what he's called us to do. This is his mission, to redeem the poor and broken that listen to him. So, this is why we should care. Because God has called us to do this. Now, what are we going to do about it? Often our gospel is hindered because we choose to not make Christ the priority of what we see in front of us. Now, what I mean by that is when we see the homeless beggar, when we see the liberal or the conservative, or the person in need, and when we see the gay man or the lesbian, do we withhold the gospel? Why would we do that? The gospel is meant for them. It's meant to save them and help them. They are our ministry which God has given us. The Israelites had a false sight about themselves. They thought because they were Israel that automatically all the Lord's blessing would be due them because they owned God. They owned the patent and the copyright on who God was. Therefore, it would only go to them. No. No. God chooses whom he blesses and how he chooses to. And is the case here. Ladies and gentlemen, every single one of you has a ministry which God has given you to fulfill. He has put a circle of friends around you, or simply people he will put in your path, which whom you are going to be sent to share the gospel with. Don't let the petty issues of this world stop you from completing the mission God has given you. To redeem the poor, to serve the brokenhearted, to give the gospel as Christ has called you to do, do you know that he didn't even give the angels the gospel to, to, to preach? He gave that to us. That's our responsibility. It's us that we need to honor the Lord with it. So this is what I would call you to do. One, obviously, come before the Lord in prayer. And ask him to remove these idols from your life, the ones that cause you to not share the gospel with another individual. Is it your politics? Is it your views on health or food or any number of things? Within religion, we create millions of reasons to get into arguments with, with one another. But in no way should that stop us from sharing the gospel. Ask the Lord to reveal where your pride is stopping you from honoring the Lord. Two. Go out and do something with it. 
I can tell you that every poor person I've ever spoken to has enjoyed having somebody to sit there and just talk with them and treat them as a human being. Don't be worried about what you think they're going to do with the money you give them or the food you buy for them. You just focus on the gospel. That's what God's given you to do. There's plenty of those in need. And not even the poverty of the streets. I can guarantee you there are people in your church right now, those that don't share their hurt because they're ashamed of it or they're scared of it. Be the one that loves them unconditionally. And honor the Lord as we serve the poor and the brokenhearted together in this community. Lord be with you, and God bless.